capítulo 1. Sorry, my microphone was off. I'm sorry, Judy. I got it. Lunch went okay. All right, good. All right. Your next witness? Your Honor, we call Mr. John C. Depp. All right. If you could stand, sir. Yes, ma'am. Good afternoon, Mr. Depp. Good afternoon. Can you please tell the jury why you're here today? Um, yes. Um, about six years ago, um, uh, Ms. Hurd made uh, some quite heinous and um, uh, disturbing, uh, brought these disturbing criminal um, acts um, against uh, me that uh, that were not based in any species of truth. Um, it was a, it was a complete shock uh, that it would. It just didn't need to go in that direction, um, as nothing, nothing of the kind had ever happened. Though it, it, the relationship, um, there were um, arguments and um, things of that nature. But never did I myself r reach the point of um, uh, striking Miss Heard in any way, nor have I ever struck uh, um, any woman um, in my life. And so I, <clears throat> at the time, because the news of this, her accusations had uh, sort of permeated the industry and then made its way through media and social media, became quite a global um, uh, let's say quote unquote f fact, if you will, and since I knew that there was no truth to it whatsoever, I felt it my responsibility to uh, to stand up not only for myself um, in that instance, but stand up for my children, who at the time were uh, f 14 and 16. And so they were in high school and uh, 
I, I thought it was diabolical that my children would have to go to um, school and have their friends or people in the school approach them with the infamous People magazine cover with uh, uh, Miss Heard with a a dark bruise on her face. Um, and then it just kept um, the it kept multiplying. It, it, it just kept getting bigger and bigger. So it was my responsibility. I felt to not only attempt to clear my name um, for the sake of well, for many reasons, but I wanted to clear. Uh, my children of of this horrid thing that they were having to read about their father that was which was untrue and also after many years of being in this um, industry um, at, at the time it was probably I'd probably been in the industry 30 plus years 35 years um, never had had any problems anything like that and I had met many people over, over the years, many, many of the people, and had had the opportunity to talk to those people and to um, g even give advice to these people. And I'm, I'm not, um, my goal is the truth. My goal is the truth because it, it, it killed me that people that I had spoken with, that I had met with over the years, who I, who maybe were in a not such a great position and they needed advice, and I gave them the best advice I could, um, all I could think of was that those people would 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 think that I um, was a fraud and that I had lied to them, and so I had to wait for my opportunity to um, address the charges, which were criminal charges, um, and 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 they, and they just weren't uh, true. So I, I felt. The responsibility of clearing the record as um, the only the only way that I could get that I could get to the point where I could speak um, has really taken this full six years, and it's been six years of trying times very strange when one day you're uh, Cinderella, so to speak, and then in 0 0.6 seconds you're Quasimodo. And um, I, 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 I didn't uh, deserve that, nor did my children, nor did the people who have believed in me for all these years, I, I didn't want anybody, any of those people to believe that I had done them wrong or lied to them or that I was a fraud. I, I, I'm, I pride myself on honesty. I pride myself on truth. Truth is the only thing I'm interested in. Other lies will get you nowhere, but, um, Lies build upon lies and build upon lies. It's too much to cover. I, I, I'm obsessed with the truth. And, um, so today is my, actually my, the first uh, opportunity that I've been able to speak about this, um, case, uh, in full for the, for the first time.
Mr. Depp, how do you feel about the intimate details of your life being aired in this process? Um, as a father, um, raising kids, you know, when they were very, very little, um, it was important to me, very important to me, to, to try to shield my children as much as possible from, um, looking at their father, uh, or their, or their mom for that matter, uh, as, uh, uh novelties. I, I didn't want my children to experience, um, hordes of paparazzis. Um, so I was always a very private person. Um, so for me to come up here and stand before you, or sit before you all, um, and spill the truth, um, is quite exposing. And, um, it's unfortunate that, that it's not only exposing for myself, it's exposing for my family, it's exposing for Miss Heard, it's exposing for, it's, um, it never had to go in this direction. And so I, I can't say that I'm embarrassed because I know that I'm doing the right thing. <clears throat> now, Mr. Depp, um, I'd like to turn a bit to your upbringing. Um, we heard a bit from your sister, Christy, last week. But can you please tell the jury in your own words about your, your childhood upbringing? Um, I had a very interesting childhood, um, one that I thought was normal until a certain age. My mother, um, I was born in Kentucky, and um, then we moved, in which we moved around quite a lot um, when I was a kid. So you were always just, my mom had this, uh, her feet were on fire and she had to move, you know, so we moved constantly. So you were always the new kid and that wasn't ever particularly pleasant. Then we moved to Florida, South Florida, when I was about seven or eight. Um, and again, moved several, several times, but um, my mother was quite unpredictable. She was very unpredictable. Um, she was a, she had the ability to be as, as cruel as anyone can be, um, with all of us, uh, that is to say my sister Christie and my my brother Danny and my sister Debbie, and also my father. <clears throat> so, um, essentially, um, she was, uh, she could become quite violent, and she was quite violent, and she was quite cruel, and she, and though, there was physical abuse, certainly, um, which could uh, be in the form of uh, an ashtray being flung at you, you know, it hits you in the head, or you'd get beat with a high heel shoe, or, or a telephone, or whatever's handy. Um, so, in our house, there was no we were never exposed to any type of safety um, or security. The, the, um, the only thing that one could do, really, um, was to try to stay out of the line of fire. You, um, I started to 
um, be able to observe and I could see, I could start to see when she was about to head, head into a, uh, when, head into a, a situation where she was going to get riled up and somebody was going to get it. Um, generally, uh, it was me. Mr. Depp, you mentioned that your mother could be cruel. How could she be cruel? Um, the, well, the various categories, I suppose, are, there are, there's, there's physical violence, of course, there's physical abuse, um, to which she was, um, that was a constant, that was just a constant, you know, we were all somewhat shell-shocked, you know, even if she just walked past us, you'd, you'd, you'd sort of shield yourself because you didn't know what was going to happen. <clears throat> Excuse me. And um, so there was there was the physical abuse, which was was a, a constant. Um, there was uh, quite a lot of verbal abuse. There was quite a lot of name calling and um, bullying. You know, m making fun of making fun of whatever defect you know one might have you know if my brother wore glasses so of course he was four eyes or and he had his teeth were messed up in the front so he was buck tooth as well um, um my sister christy which this is such a a hideous psychological play uh my 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 father's uh parents were quite refined. My mother comes from Eastern Kentucky, which is, is uh, where you grow up in shacks and ho in hollers, you, you know. And uh, my, my, my mother despised uh, my father's parents. And my grandmother's name was Violet. And Every now and again, you would hear my mother just scream across the house, Come here, Violet. Get in here, Violet. And Christy, my sister, knew very well that that was a, a deep, a deep cut psychologically, emotionally. But we had to take it. I mean, you, you just had to take the pain. Um... I, I was born with a very strange, it was a very rare uh, thing in my eye as the, the, the back of the lens is spherical, uh, normally um, is spherical, so in this eye it isn't normal. This eye I was born um, with a more conical uh, lens, so uh, my brain never learned to see out of my left eye and they noticed when I was about uh, three, four, five, three, four, that I had a, a lazy eye, a wandering eye and um, um, she would call me, she would call me cockeye, one eye, um, any, anything anything she could get to, to uh, uh, demean, humiliate. Um, uh, I even had to wear, um, I had to wear an eye patch on my good eye uh, to strengthen my, my bad eye so that it would cease to wander. It, with a mus it was exercising the muscles of the eye. Though the brain had never learned to see, so I still, uh, my vision in my left eye is, uh, I'm legally blind in my left eye, but uh, so yeah, the 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 verbal abuse, the psychological abuse, was uh, was almost worse than the than the than the than the, the beatings. 
because the beatings were just physical pain. And the physical pain, you learn to deal with, you learn to accept it, you learn to deal with it. Um, but the, uh, the psychological and emotional abuse, that's what, uh, that's what kind of tore us up, I think. What about your father? What was he like? My father, my father was a very kind man. Uh, in fact, my father's still alive. He's, he's a very kind man. Um, he's, he's a very quiet man. Um, in fact, he's very shy. Um, not a confrontational uh, person in any way. And when Betty Sue, my mother, um, would go off on 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 a tangent uh, toward my my father, um, and 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 of course in front of the kids, it was no matter to her. Uh, he would he would um, he, he amazingly remained very very stoic. And uh, never, as she was rationing him with horrible um, things, he stood there and just looked at her while she delivered the pain. And he swallowed it. He took it. Um, there was never one moment never a moment when my father um, lost control and attacked my mother or hit my mother or even said even said a bad thing to my mother what what I the things that I witnessed were there were a couple of times when it got too far that I, I would see his, I could see his eyes welling up as he was staring at her, saying nothing. Um, and then the most that he would do is he would, he would, he would punch a, a, a wall. I, w I once saw him punch a wall and um, it would shatter his hand because it wasn't, it wasn't drywall, it was um, proper concrete and uh, steel wire and rebar and things of that nature and uh, um, but still never never touched her never um, argued with her he, uh, he 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 remained a gentleman and to me as a five-year-old boy I kept thinking to myself I kept wondering why why does he take it how does he how does he take this and 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 why doesn't he leave her um, but he didn't you know um, he was able to maintain his calm and his composure he was able to maintain uh, his relationship with his children um he was uh, he was he was a good man. He is a good man. You mentioned that you saw your father punch a wall. How many times did you witness that? I mean, I, I, out of out of I couldn't count the amount of fights that they had, but I I, I know that I I've, I've seen my father strike uh, a wall. Um, two or three times tops once <clears throat> when he broke his hand um, but yeah two, two two three times at tops you know was your father ever abusive to you or any of your siblings uh, no my father was never my father was not an abusive man um, at the same time, my father was also um, 
to some degree at the mercy of Betty Sue. Uh, because if he argued with what she wanted done, and that would just turn into uh, a, a, another um, barrage of, of, of hatred uh, towards him. So I can remember my father coming home from work and m maybe I'd, I'd, I'd gotten a bad report card or maybe I'd uh, gotten in trouble at school or um, something like that. And my father would arrive home from work and the first thing she would say was, John, Take, take him out there, he gets the belt, give him the belt. And he wanted to know what it was about, so he'd take me out to the garage, and uh, I'll never forget the uh, this white, thick leather 1970s era, thick leather white belt that he would um, take off and, and um, and then he would uh, commence to uh, inflict the punishment uh, on on me. Um, but interestingly, there was a, there was one time when my father I I kept telling him I I didn't do this. It was another incident. I, I kept swearing to him that I I did not do what Betty Sue my, what my mom had said that I'd done, but he went through with the punishment anyway. <clears throat> and then, uh, not long after, he found out that I had been telling the truth and that I hadn't done what uh, I, what my mom had said that I'd done. Um, and he, he came to me and uh, apologized to me for um, for having gone through with the whipping, you know, with the belt. And um, I have to say, um, my mom never did that. She couldn't. She she knew what she knew. She was raised how she was raised. And. Um, I had no power to change what was inside of her, you know. How did your parents' relationship ultimately come to an end, to your understanding? Um, when my father left, I, I didn't realize that he had left. He left to her. I, I was 15. I had, I had already uh, left school, and I was a musician. I was playing in clubs and such. And uh, he left for work one morning, just like every day, and was packing his car, and then he left. And then hours later, uh, my mom, Betty Sue, came home from work. It was about 3.30 in the afternoon. And she walked in the door and stopped and, and just looked around like she felt something. And she just, I said, what's wrong? She said, your daddy's gone. I said, well, yeah, I seen him leave for work this morning. She said, no, 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 he's gone, he's gone. And she ran into the, uh, into their bedroom and into their closet. And I followed her and I, she opened the door. And there was one, yeah, his side, his rack of clothing and all his belongings were gone. And she was quite upset and I took her car and drove to my father's work and I sat down in front of him at 15 and I said listen seems as though somebody stole all your clothes out of the closet and um, and he said uh, he said yeah yeah he said I, I'm done I, I can't I can't do it anymore I can't I can't live it anymore you're the man. You're the man now. And uh, those words didn't didn't quite sit well with me. I, I I didn't feel like I was ready to hear those words. But that's what I got. 
um, then my mom got very went into a very very dark uh, place, a very deep dark depression, as you can imagine, and um, and uh, she one afternoon I woke up, I'd, I'd fallen asleep, and I woke up and walked out into the living room, and I saw my my mother, um, like, uh, very feebly, um, and like almost, it was like a slow motion crawl. If I could stand up, I could show you just the what I saw. Do you mind? Do you no, mind? you can stand up. Thank you. Um, I saw, I saw my my mother. You know, in that in that mode. So instantly, I knew that something was dreadfully wrong. And um, there was drool coming out of her mouth. And as I was about to run and call, the front door busted open, and uh, my uncle and uh, two paramedics came in and um, threw on the gurney and whisked her out of the house to get her to the hospital to um, to pump her stomach. And she'd uh, she had. Uh, Swallowed uh, a multitude of of pills to 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 try to take herself out to, to try to commit suicide. And uh, when she got out of the hospital, she was a small firecracker of a woman. She was about five foot two. But when she got out of the hospital, the depression was so deep. She she was down to like she lived on the couch and she weighed about 70 pounds and that all that imagery spun into my head at that time that I thought that was a very in my head at the time I thought that that was a cowardly way for my father to have left and I I, I was uh deeply upset by that um, until my father and I had a conversation um, years later where I asked him what really happened what how did it happen when I was older and he told me the story your honor may we approach sure Mr. Duff, how did you feel about your father when he left? I would. I was. I was. I was very disappointed in him because I started to believe that his exit was was sneaky, cowardly. 
he didn't, when he said goodbye to me, when he left for work that morning, he just said goodbye, you know, goodbye, Bob, and I went, see you later, Pop, and that was it. Until um, I learned the truth from, uh, from him. And without getting into what your father told you, why is, how, how has your um, impression of your father changed now? Objection relevance. Your Honor, this is just an understanding of his perception of his family. I'll sustain the objection. Next question. Mr. Depp, what have you learned from um, your experience in your childhood and observing your father in your childhood? I learned that I was wrong about my first impressions of his, his exit from the family. Um, very wrong. And um, I'll, tell you, I'll tell you one thing I, that I learned that was, that was uh, one of the best lessons I believe I've ever learned in my life ever could learn in your life, in my life, was um, based on my experiences as, as a child and what I'd seen and experienced, I knew exactly how to raise children um, when, when, uh, when my girl Vanessa got pregnant. Um, I knew exactly how to raise children, which was to do the opposite of what they did, of what Betty Sue did. Never raise your voice in front of the children, never. Um, screaming out the word no to them. I never wanted to tell my kids no. I, I wanted to tell them that. I wanted to show them that there were options. You don't have to stick the coat hanger in the electrical socket. You know, saying no is an abrupt thing, but to talk to them and say, if you understand the repercussions of something, then you won't go there. So maybe think about this as opposed to this. Give this some thought, you know. But that will clearly, um, that could kill you. So I, I would ease them away from um, things of that nature with a more, more of an, more of a conversation as opposed to a, 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 you know, a flat out, don't you ever do that again and threats and things of that nature. I, I did not raise my children that way. Nor, nor did Vanessa. We, and we never raised our voices in front of our children, ever. How do you and think your experiences with your parents in your childhood affected your approach to your relationship with Miss Hurd? I'm sorry, um, one more time. How did your experiences observing your parents as a child affect your approach to your relationship with Miss Hurd? Well, in the beginning of my relationship with Miss Hurd, um, there was, from what I recall and what I remember, she was, she was, um, it was as if she were, it was, she was too good to be true. Um, she was, attentive, she was loving, um, she was smart, she was kind, she was funny, she was understanding, she, um, and, and we, we, we had many things in common, certain blues music and, well, music, literature, things of that nature. So for that year or year and a half, it was uh, 
it was amazing. Um, there were a couple of things that, I don't know, stuck in my head that I noticed that I thought might be a little bit of a, a dilemma at some point. For, for example, <clears throat> if I, if I, 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 was, I worked quite a lot, and when I would come home from work, um, I would, I would come in the house or the hotel and she would sit me down on the couch and give me a glass of wine and uh, take my boots off, set them to the side and, um, I'd never experienced anything like that. In, in, in my life, I, I, I just never thought that was, I just never experienced that before. And it became a regular thing um, that she did, uh, this kind of routine. And I remember one night I came home from work and, uh, and I think she was on the phone or something and or busy, she was doing something. And um, so I sat down on the couch and I took my boots off and um, suddenly Miss Hurd approached with this look on her face that she, and she just said, what did you just do? What did you do? I said, what, what, what do you mean? You took your boots off. I said, I said yeah, yes, I did. You, 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 you were busy, you know. No, 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 that's my job. That's what I do. You don't do that. I do that. Okay. All right, then. And then she said, let me get you a glass of wine. And she brought me the glass of wine. But I did take pause, of course, at the fact that she was visibly shaken or upset that I had... Uh, I had broken her rules of routine. I thought that strange. And then once that, once you notice something like that, then you start to notice other little tidbits and things that come out. And then, and then uh, within a year, a year and a half, she had become this another person, almost. Mr. Depp, we're going to talk about Ms. Hurd in a, a couple minutes, but I'd like to first talk about um, your career in Hollywood. And so could you please tell the jury how you ended up acting in the first place? Um, I ended up acting by accident. I uh, was a musician, and I'd moved out to Los Angeles with my band, uh, when I was 20 years old. Um, and then there were a couple of uh, things that happened in the band where the band split up. And uh, I remember I was filling out job applications and then Nick, uh, uh, with a friend of mine who happens to be, he, happened, he was an actor, uh, less known then than he is now, Nicholas Cage. Um, and I was filling out job applications at any, you know, video stores, clothing stores, anything, and just to be able to pay the rent. And um, Nick Cage said, uh, you know, why, why don't you meet my agent, you know, because uh, I, I, I think you're an actor. I think you could be an actor. And I said, Look, I'll meet anybody, you know. I'll do anything at this point. And so he sent me to his his agent, Eileen Feldman, and I met with her. Um, she sent me to read for a, uh, a casting director named Annette Benson, who was casting a film called The Nightmare on Elm Street. Um, and... Uh, they brought me back to read for the director, Wes Craven, and um, I read for Wes, 
uh, Craven and somehow got the job. But I mean, I was by no means an actor. I didn't have any desire to be an actor. I was a musician. Uh, but the fact that these people were going to pay me what I found to be a ludicrous sum of money, which was uh, it was kind of the SAG minimum, uh, it was $1,284 a week, which I, I mean, you know, I'd never seen that kind of dough before in my life. Um, and so I, I suddenly, you know, and then I did some other couple of dumb movies because I, I, I still, in my mind, I was a musician and this was just a way to uh, pay the rent, pay the bills, live. Um, then suddenly I found myself on that road. I had been placed on that road uh, as, a, as an actor. And, and then I, one thing led to another from film to film. And then I uh, was cast in a TV series called 21 Jump Street when I was 22, I believe. Mr. Depp, between the time that you um, were cast in Nightmare on Elm Street and you um, were cast in 21 Drum Jump Street, mm -hmm. how did you enjoy acting during that time? It was foreign to me. It was foreign to me, but I, I, didn't, I, did, I didn't have any great um, ambition to be an actor. I, I'm a, a naturally, normally, I'm, I'm a, I've always been quite a shy person. I've always been quite introverted. And so there was a very strange metamorphosis from being one of four, that is to say, one of four in a band where you have this fraternity or this brotherhood um, and you're out there fighting the world together to try to get that record deal or whatever you're looking for. And uh, when the when, when, when I got on the series and my life started to change in various ways, that is to say that people started to, you know, you go into a restaurant and You'd see people whispering and pointing and all that. I, I was uh, I was very uncomfortable with it. I was very uncomfortable with it, and I didn't like it. Um, just just because it, I, I, ne I never wanted to be the lead singer and the guy out front and uh, we'll, we'll get all the attention. And I, I didn't. So suddenly I was on my own, and I was. Uh, having to deal with this, uh, this 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 newfound sort of notoriety and it was it was odd it was very odd and it was yeah it was a very uncomfortable thing I, I mean it, I don't think it's anything that one can get used to I don't I, I wouldn't I'm not I'm still not used to it now and I which I'm actually glad that I'm not used to it because if I were, uh, I don't think I'd be the same person that I am. Mr. Depp, did there come a time when you became passionate about acting? Once I realized that, I, that that's the road that I was on and that any attempt at going back to music would would be a, um, a, a, a not, it would have been, I hated the idea that since the television series had come out and I had been exposed as this, this, this character or this actor, uh, um, I had to realize in, in my own mind and heart that there was no going back to music because I, I didn't want to 
you know, I didn't want to, I didn't want to use whatever amount of success that I had um, attained from the TV series and that sort of thing. I didn't want to use that to influence, um, you, you know, some career in music. I, I, I had far too much respect for um, music um, than to just uh, become what they wanted me to become, which was a, you know, teen idol or a teeny, you know, that, that's, that sort of thing. I, um, I fought that with, uh, with everything in my being. So once I realized that music was no longer uh, an option, then um, I began to uh, study um, at various places, you know, the Loft Studio, which is now long gone um, in, in Los Angeles. I, I studied with uh, some other teachers, uh, Sandra Seacat, um, I read all the books that you could read, and all that was great, but um, you realize that the only way to, the only way to l l learn, or, or the, the only way to learn how to, it's not act necessarily, the only way to learn how to react and behave because it's just behavior and it's reaction um, was to do it. It, it you it's on the job training it's trial by fire so um, I did my best to to work up work my work up my own approach towards the towards uh, a character and such. And what were a couple of the first few uh, projects that you worked on where you were really able to implement that approach? I would say, I, I, I would say that the, fir the f first film that I had done that I really took, um, where I really felt okay, I've done the work. I I I, I know what I need to do. Um, I would say that was that, that where I considered myself an actor. I suppose was 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 when um, Oliver Stone cast me in uh, Platoon in 1986. How did you come to be cast in Pirates of the Caribbean? Uh well, that's that's many years later, but uh, I I had been um, Disney had offered me a film um, called Hidalgo I, when it was a, about a man and his horse in the desert and stuff, and I I, I read the uh, the screenplay and I just didn't think it was for me, um, but I wanted to have a meeting with them because. I, at that point, I had a um, two-year-old, uh, yeah, two, year, two, two and a half-year-old daughter, and so, or three, and and and, and the, uh, for three years, I watched nothing but animated films, uh, uh, cartoons from Tex Avery to Bugs Bunny to. Um, that, that 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 was all I, I I watched with my with my little girl, and I received the screenplay for Pirates, and it, it was uh, I, I somehow in my mind I saw this opportunity like a, a way to mesh characters. Like, car like cartoon characters. For example, Wiley e. Coyote gets a boulder dropped on his head, 
and he's completely crushed, but in the, they cut to the next scene and he's just got a little bandage on his head. So I, I started thinking about the, the parameters uh, that, are, that were available to cartoon characters. And if they were available to cartoon characters and, and, and nobody ever asked a question, whether you were five or 95, you didn't ask a question. Oh, Wiley well, Coyote, of course he's still alive. So I tried to incorporate these, uh, these kind of ideas into the character of Captain Jack Sparrow so that, so, 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 so that I could try to push those parameters and and, and control the sort of suspension of disbelief, the, to be able to control the um, characters' actions, words, movements, and put them in a place where the things that he would do or say were so either ludicrous or um, mainly something that also something the cartoon characters can get away with things we can't. Captain Jack Sparrow can do things that I could never do. He could say things that I could never say. So it was for me a way to stretch the parameters of, of a character and, uh, uh, and take, uh, take a risk uh, in doing that. But if it, if it panned out, I, 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 and I felt I was on a pretty good mission. If it panned out, I thought that it might be a character who would be accepted by five-year-olds and 45-year-olds and 65-year-olds and 85-year-olds and in the same way that Bugs Bunny is, uh, you know, You mentioned believed. that, sorry, you mentioned mm -hmm. that you received the script. When was that? I'm sorry. When did you first receive the script for Pirates of the Caribbean? Uh, the 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 first screenplay I I received was uh, 2002, I believe. Yeah, 2002. And what did you think of that script when you received it? Um, I thought that it had all the kind of hallmarks of a of a of a Disney film. That is to say, a kind of a predict predictable. <laughs> predictable three-act structure um, with uh, with and the character of Captain Jack was was more um, he was more like a swashbuckler type that would kind of swing in shirtless and you know be the hero um, and I I had quite different ideas about the character, so I incorporated my notes into the character and brought that character to life, um, much to the chagrin of Disney initially. Now, when you say you made changes to the character, how did you do that? Um, just, you know, in, in preparation, you know, the, 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 the the same, the very same way that I've ever approached any character. You, you, you look for a back history. You base it on, um, you know, it could be anything. Like Edward Scissorhands, for example, was I based on a, a dog that I'd had and uh, newborn babies. My sister had, had a couple of new babies, and I watched them. You know. And I, because I thought that Edward would see things from the the sort of un uh, the uh, from a place of innocence um, and n not knowing exactly what things meant or were, and and also that that look of uh, a, a pure innocent child when they experience something for the first time um those those were the 
the two main ingredients that I th thought would serve the character. And with Captain Jack, again, the cartoons, you know, the, the Pepe Le Pew, it was a, it was a, uh, it, it's like, it's like making a soup, you know, it's ingredients, it's just ingredients. Um, there's some Pepe Le Pew in there, there's some Keith Richards in there, um, there's a bit of a, you, you, you know, I figured this is a guy who's been on the sea for the majority of his life, quite possibly his brains may have been scrambled a bit by the sun. And also I thought that he'd been on the sea for so long that he had his sea legs, but when he got on land, he just didn't have his land legs. So he could never quite <laughs> stand still. How did the film ultimately turn out in your view? Um, I didn't see it. But uh, I believe that the film, well, I mean, the film did pretty well, apparently, and uh, and uh, they wanted to keep going, uh, making uh, making more. And I was fine to do that uh, as uh, it was, it, there's great freedom in in being able to, it's not like you become that person, but if you, if you know that character, to the degree that I did, because he was not what the writers wrote, so they really weren't able to write for him. So once you know a character better than the writers, that's when you, um, you have to uh, uh, be true to the character and add your words, add, add, the, add the rewrites. Um, I was, uh, I, yeah, no, I, I, I believed in the character wholeheartedly and the, uh, initially the Disney uh, folks were somewhat upset. Now, you mentioned that the film was, to your understanding, a great success. How did your life change after the first Pirates of the Caribbean movie came out? Um, though I'd been around for many years already, and, uh, and uh, people, people knew who I was and all that. Um, after Pirates 1 came out, there was a, a, a completely different, it was a completely different uh, way of life was, was, was being sort of, you know, my family and I were being plunged into. That is to say, you know, at our house in Los Angeles, you would have, you would have people trying to climb the gates to get into Sea Captain Jack Sparrow um, you would you would have people trying to bust in the gates dressed as Captain Jack Sparrow. You would have it, it and follow you or follow you and your family. So that was that was the moment when um, the, the, there was no other way but to uh, we we had to hire more security guards, and I was certainly worried for my kids. Um, safety, and so then we, that's when the, instead of just the one guy, there were, there, you know, there were, started, there became several security people, because I wanted to make sure that my kids were safe when they went to school, or when they went to Disneyland, or when they went to the mall, or whatever. Um, so yes, more security and, you know, then just getting followed, you know, by hordes of paparazzi and things like that. It's, 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 uh, I've had worse jobs, certainly. I can't complain about it, but, um, yeah, uh, after a while you realize that, uh, um, anonymity, uh, has left the building. 
a long time ago. You know, the anonymity's gone. Um, and that's a, that's an odd thing to deal with. Um, when you just, I mean, you can't just drive down to the diner and get a cup of coffee or something. It's not uh, possible. It, it, it turns into something else altogether. So it's, you know, it's acceptance. And there's, of course, there's a bit of sacrifice uh, involved. I, I, I can't complain about the uh, work that I've been given. I can't complain about any of that. Um, I have no right to. Um, but it, it, it does make you have to think very creatively with when you've got little kids about how to take them to the park or, to, you know, to the swings or to the this or that or movie or, you know, it becomes a, it becomes a strategic mission. And, 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 and that's what happened after Pirates. Now, you mentioned your family. Who did your family consist of at that time? My, my, Vanessa, um, Parody, the mother of my children, um, who we were together for f 14, 15 years. Um, myself, uh, our daughter, Lily Rose, and um, our boy, Jack. Now, you mentioned hiring more security. Did you already have a security team at the time that Pirates of the Caribbean came out? I'd had, I, yes, because there had been, there had been more films prior to that, I mean, a number of films prior to that, so uh, I was, I was, uh, recognized and I was known so if you wanted to attempt to have any experience that might be normal you, you sort of had to have somebody around to uh, get you out of a squirrely situation should it arise so I had security prior to that f for who would travel with myself and my family um, but not like, you know, when I was at work, I, back then I didn't have security at work so much, you know, anything, not before Pirates. Pirates was really the, uh, that was the thing that everything, um, it, it all turned around. It all just went, went, uh, weird. So how did your security team change after Pirates of the Caribbean came out? Well, like I said, with anything, it, it had it, it become more strategic, and you had to have more guys or gals uh, because um, because if if Vanessa, if Vanessa, for example, she worked in France quite a lot, and if she was in France, um, and and. I was in LA with the kiddies then um, and working, um, security would uh, security would basically pick my kids up at school or whatever and bring them home. So that became the routine, driving them to school, bringing them home. Um, um, so, 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 yeah, and then if I went somewhere, so, so the, it just, the security guards kind of multiplied because you needed to protect your street, your house, your kids. Endless. So after Pirates of the Caribbean, who has been on your security team? Um... Jerry Judge was was with me for oh boy over twenty years. Um, Jerry Judge uh, is is you, we mentioned it before. He um, uh, it was a year or two ago. He um, he it, Jerry would 
go on film sets with me. He would, he would do reconnaissance missions, you know, that is to say, he would go to a country before we would go there, make sure all the hotel rooms were all taken care of and such. Um, or when I went on tour with, uh, say, the Hollywood Vampires, uh, um, which is a, a, a band that I played with, um, he would come on the road with me with another security um, guard. Uh, so there was Jerry Judge, there was Malcolm Connolly, who's been with me for 20 years or more, um, Leonard Damien, Sean Pett, um, Travis uh, McGivern, um, Mark Gibbs, I, I mean, there are a few. Are all of these uh, security personnel still with you today? Jerry has gone on to uh, somewhere else. He's Jerry made uh, Jerry Jerry passed away uh, from cancer. So Jerry Jerry made his exit. Um, but the majority of those no, the, I believe all of those fellows are still with me. Yes. When did Mr. Judge pass away? I, th I believe it was two, two years ago, roughly, maybe a little less than two years ago. Um, now I'd like to go through a couple of the names that you just mentioned. Um, what is Malcolm Conley's purview in, in the realm of your security team? What is his role? Exactly, yes. Um, well, uh, now that Jerry is, um, J Jerry and Malcolm had worked together for a very long time. So I'd met Malcolm through Jerry. Um, after, after Jerry's passing, Malcolm obviously took over um, for Jerry. And so he would, uh, he would, uh, he took on extra uh, responsibilities. He would have to make sure that there was someone on the ground, wherever we were going, that had done their, their uh, um, recon, you know, the reconnaissance, and to make sure that. Uh, um, everything was set up by the time we got there and that it would be a straight shot into the hotel without a gaggle of paparazzi. Um, you know, you didn't have to walk through 50 screaming, hollering photographers. So, you, you know, you'd go in through a garage door and through a slippery kitchen and you were, then you were taken to your room, where you stayed. <laughs> when did uh, when did Malcolm Conley join your team? M Malcolm had joined. I mean, Jerry brought him on. So Malcolm has been with me for over twenty years uh, now. And so in those twenty years, how often have you physically been present with Malcolm? With Malcolm. Yes. Endless, countless, all over the world, um, all over the world, uh, everywhere, In Los Angeles, J Japan, um, Serbia, um, you know, films, tour, um, Malcolm was my, uh, he, you know, he, 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 he uh, when we were on the Vampires tour in Europe, throughout Europe, and Malcolm was on the bus with me. We. We lived on the bus together, basically. How often is Malcolm in L.A. with you? It, it depends if, if there's a, or if there was a, a, a larger premiere, you know, where, um, you know, where it, it had to be worked out so that it didn't turn into a chaotic, uh, or, and or dangerous event because sometimes there are between you and the people there are these barriers and uh, 
sometimes the professional uh, photographers or the professional autograph people will surge forward and in the front rows of these behind these barriers you have you have little kids and el uh, older women and older men and so when the professionals would surge forward these people would start getting kind of crushed against the this metal deterrent and um that 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 was the that was the most uh, worrisome thing when you, when 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 you're at a premiere and there are thousands and thousands of people there and i've always called it running the gauntlet essentially what it is is that people are there to um to say hi and to support uh, the film or the cast or whatever so i um i've always gone out and and signed for those people i've always gone out and signed for all or as many as i possibly could i mean to the point of sometimes jerry judge would literally pick me up off the ground to make me stop signing and take me away um um so, yeah, uh, it was uh, those 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 kind of things. Again, you don't you don't really get used to that, you know. Um, so, I, I forget what the original part of your question was. I, <laughs> Got lost in the gauntlet. Uh, I'll move on. What, uh, what about well, Sean Bed? How long is you want to go ahead and make a take a break now? Would that be okay for afternoon That's break? Fine. That's Let's fine. Why don't we go ahead and, and do that, ladies and gentlemen? We'll go ahead and take our afternoon break. Please do. Uh, we'll take fifteen minutes. Do not discuss uh, the case and do not do any outside research. Okay. Thank you. Stay there for a minute. Sir, just a reminder, since you're on the witness stand now, you cannot discuss your testimony with anybody to include your attorneys, okay? All right. And let's come back. I guess we can come back at uh, 3.35. Is that okay for everybody? Okay. We'll take a recess. Thank you. Thank you. All right.